Hello, good evening. Um, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Bima, for inviting me to present this project tonight and for inviting the dancers as well. Um, I am uh, thankful to be part of the Untold Stories Matters of Life and Death series, and um, Leah Crosby, Maya Vegu, and Henry Walujo are three of the dancers that participated in this project. And the other two, Jason Franklin and Jessica Javaris, are not here this evening, but I want to thank them as well. Without these individuals, the work would not exist as it does. I also would like to acknowledge that I too live, work, and make art on the ancestral land of the Suquamish people. And I do so with uh, an awareness and respect for them as a people uh, who were the original caretakers of this land. I'll talk a little bit about the project, its inception and my process, and then we'll move into some live interpretation. And first off, it might be helpful to know that I myself am a former dancer, and I feel that the body and dance is the most raw and instantaneous way to express and share common experiences. Everybody has a body, and I think that the body can be a source of empathy. And my intuition because of this was to use the human form to um, tap into the experience of the, pan of the pandemic, and also to compel the viewer to consider their own experiences in uh, new ways. Back in July of 2021, I was compelled to make work that would give an alternative and an additional voice to our experiences. As a whole, imminent proximity confronts the implications of the global pandemic on the human psyche, and it's meant to represent multiple aspects of these experiences. However, this evening we will be concentrating on one of those aspects, and that is um, the threat to our interconnectedness and to the, our very lives that the pandemic has posed and continues to pose. I developed this work by conducting field practices, and I was most interested in what would arise out of asking people to be in close proximity, tap into their own experiences, and move into movement improvisation. And I used certain loose prompts with them, and those prompts stemmed from uh, conversations that we had in which we, sh we shared our, our personal experiences. So knowing that this work is about experiences in the pandemic, and it's not about dancer dancers, you might wonder why use dancers then in the first place? Why not use normal people? Um, non, non dancers, non professionals. Um, and my answer is that for this project, um, I knew that physical interaction was going to be foundational to convey my ideas. And I knew that this required people that had a trained bodily intelligence and an ability to use their bodies as their primary source of expression through movement improvisation. So collaborating with dancers seemed uh, the most logical and dancers by nature are embodied artists. Um, I do want to mention also that this particular uh, group of dancers, I reached out specifically to them because I had seen them work together before and I was impressed by their rapport and how comfortable they were with each other, how much they trusted each other and I knew that we wouldn't have to waste any time breaking down boundaries. So, um, so during these collaborative field practices, I wanted things to unfold very organically through processes of um, improvisation. And this image, Gathering Solace, is actually one that came out of probably our first half hour or so together. And I just wanted to get a feel for how this group of people could move together um, when being asked to stay in touch, <laughs> be on top of this rock and I, I was curious about the way they could fold in and out of each other, the way they carried their, their weight, the way they shared their weight. Um, and this wonderful idea of a morphing organism came from the very first um, minutes of our time together and um, it became a way for me to communicate with the dancers. It was very fun because I would say, hey morph, and they would kind of move around this multi-organism um, creature and then I could say pause and they would pause and I would be able to capture what I wanted to and I could also fast forward and rewind them and there's they're they're so amazing and they're such professionals that if I had missed a moment that I knew I wanted to come back to I would say okay pause and rewind and they would sort of like shift back in um, 
So it's, it's really fun to get to work with, with people like that. Um, let me sidestep for a moment and say that I consider myself to be an interdisciplinary artist and a process-based artist. In part, this is because when I work, I combine my own movement with photographic capture. And I do so not only because it's my intuition to photograph uh, in that way, but it also gives me the ability to offer alternative perspectives that we might not usually have. Because of the themes in this project, I felt that it was even more important to work in this way. So in order to enhance the felt sense of proximity and sense of intimacy, and the only way for me to truly do that was to often integrate myself with them and move with them. And they were gracious enough to allow me into that, into that personal space that they were creating. Um, and in this way, I could follow the ebb and flow of their energy. Um, I could predict gesture and all the time while hunting and waiting for those key emotive moments and compositions. So it's not new to us that uh, physical intimacy can pose threats. There's always a need uh, and desire for intimacy, platonic or otherwise, and they always have to be carefully considered. And the pandemic certainly has been no different. And as I had started off this sequence of photographs, I think if I remember correctly, I had simply asked Leah to cradle Hendry on a log um, in the ferns of Erica's back ravine. Um, and <laughs> they eventually moved quite naturally together and ended up in, in this position here. And um, they had effortlessly, effortlessly glided into this very evocative posture. And at home, when I was reviewing the images and this one came up, I was really filled with a complete visceral sensation of, wow, they've come into this moment and Leah, for some reason, has naturally given into this idea of needing to temper uh, this intimate moment that they were having together. So this is an aside, when I am in the field photographing, I'm rarely thinking of, for example, with this, I'm not thinking of, let's create a moment that looks like there's something evocative and powerful going on, but let's make it look like we're not supposed to be doing it. It's way, it's way more organic than that, and I don't necessarily know what the images mean, mean or what they say until I'm editing. Um, my hope is that this image, touching hesitance, speaks to the underlying confusion that we've been living in and to the sometimes unspoken concern about the possible implications of our togetherness. Um, in this image, I see some distrust, some uncertainty, some intrepidation, um, and it's not Jessica's distrust of Jason as a person. I feel that it's her distrust of the situation, of the context, and she's, I love the look on her face because I feel like I can see that whole dialogue playing out in her head in the moment as she's trying to navigate this uh, relationship with Jason. Our need for connection is instinctual. Um, at the same time, it can be exhausting. This, in, in, excuse me, this image is called Enduring Kinship. And Leah's physical attachment to Maya here, it's not aggressive. In fact, it looks loving to me, but Maya's reaction uh, here suggests that she is experiencing something totally different. And there's a need to, seems to be a need to peel off this person, not have to carry the burden of supporting them. And perhaps the message implied between the two people here can actually be one that applies to each of us internally, and that being we are in a challenging situation um, and we are constantly having to gauge what makes us comfortable, how cautious we need to be, and that all that it's exhausting. Um, most of the close-up images in this body of work are not cropped, and I wanted to remain faithful to the underlying thread of physical proximity, so I felt that it was impor important for me to maintain this practice. And I also love the confusion of limbs and body parts and, and bodies that comes from it because I feel like it echoes um, a lot of our experience right now out in the real world. So when I'm looking at a set of images and I wanna choose one, it becomes this question of what are the tiny nuances and differences in the images? What do they express? And then ultimately, which of these do I wanna claim as the statement and which will um, fit into the body of work the best? 
And when I'm editing, I'm often looking for the most visceral. However, when I was looking at this set, I felt that they were all very visceral. Um, but I finally did land here, and I call it locating desperation. Um, compositionally, it's not actually the strongest, but I decided to go with it because I feel like it best conveys the psychological and the emotional qualities that I was looking for. Um, there's a strange balance of desperation uh, that's between uh, Maya and then this almost tender holding on the part of Hendry. And then we have the bizarreness of Leah being without half of their face with their strange hand reaching towards the canopy, perhaps seeking uh, guidance and help. And it was ultimately the subtle shifts in body language happening that made me choose this image, especially um, with Maya, as she's literally trying to insert herself into this intimate space being held by Hendry and Leah. And it's in her facial expression, it's in the, in the way her shoulders practically seems to be dislocating in order to fit. And it's the, it's the concentration of all this, uh, excuse me, all this energy that the three of them bring together that, um, and, the and the intention of that that reads so well for me. Here's another set of images that I had to work with. Um, I feel like we've had to relearn how to be with each other and that we will probably be relearning um, and adapting uh, from now on, <laughs> given the pandemic. And in order to give visual representation to that idea, um, for this set of images, I was pretty specific with them. I asked them to um, explore each other's skin as if it was the first time that they had seen it or felt it or interacted with it. And this is the final image that I've chosen for the series and I call it Mapping Touch. Um, I wanted there to be a longing for touch and a curiosity behind it. And I wanted the interaction of between touch and flesh to be the most prominent thing. So I chose this image um, where their faces aren't uh, as apparent. This image is bordering threat. And for this, before this um, session, we had been talking specifically about fear and about anxiety that we've been living with. And so the prompts I used in the field stemmed from specifically from those uh, conversations and dealt with those concepts. And what started appearing was a powerful visual dichotomy that played out in their bodies. And fear and the bodily instinct to protect oneself came through very strongly. And in, in the same image, we have Hendry, again with his gentle tenderness, um, his kindness in his desire to be connected. But Maya's response was to bite. And I didn't direct her to bite. It is what came up organically for her. And um, she did do so gently out of respect for the process. Um, so for me, this is what embodiment and art making means. It's not just the body's ability to express and perform what verbal language cannot, but it's also the artist's ability and their intention to do so. So for me, remaining very in tune with what was happening for them uh, as they improvised was very important. And capturing these kinds of moments um, in their emergent state was, was key. And I feel as though at this point in the pandemic, we are seeking some sort of unity and reconnection. And I hope that there can be a renewed effort for oneness. And this is one of the images that I do offer in the work as a visual reference to this hope and to the potential and the need for empathy and solidarity in this effort. Thank you for listening. I look forward to answering your questions later on. Um, please visit my website. You can learn more about the project there. And I am actively fundraising for the solo exhibition I'm having in December. And finally, I wanna let you know before we move on that um, Imminent Proximity is only the first series in my broader work, Proximity Project, which is a long-term photographic work that illuminates the experiences of being human. And to take this opportunity to uh, share a quick glimpse into a future and separate body of work that is currently in progress. And it's Hendry and Leah also. Okay, thank you.
Well, I'm going to uh, invite three of the dancers um, to join me. And uh, Leah Crosby, come on up. <laughs> Maya Vegu. And Henry Walujo. And I think, um, so this isn't a, a formal dance performance. They're not going to perform a set choreographed piece and then ex exit into wings and be gone. Um, this is meant to be more of an interactive situation. Um, you can start with questions, questions for me, questions for us. You can um, choose to share some of your personal experiences of the pandemic and we can throw them a prompt and see how they improvise through that prompt. Where did you see death and dying unfolding through this process? I mean, we've, we've done a number of different shoots at like different periods in the pandemic. And there were definitely like working sessions that felt higher risk than others. Um, Personal death? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think also different flavor, but there were some of the, and this was less apparent in the images that you shared, but we, have done some work with like a like a burnt out like scary stump and also in some some locations where like the there's images of death around us and that I feel like shapes how we interact with each other. Yeah, and this work was proposed to us really in, in this like initial bottom out period of the pandemic where we weren't leaving the house a lot. There were no vaccines yet. Everybody was making a lot of adaptations. So there is this very um, prevalent idea of, of sort of relating to, you know, this, this existential idea of mortality suddenly being all around us. And one of my personal responses was the last project that the three of us were in together prior to um, beginning imminent proximity. Sarah was the photographer for our performances and that project dealt a lot with generational trauma and death and we really got involved in that process and then it ended and pandemic started right after that. So there was, there was very much a strong ending right. of us working together at that component or at that point and being brought in again for the first time to work on something together with Sarah sort of picked up some of those old threads, I think, from a, a former project and really tied together a lot of those ideas of death and mortality. And it felt heavy in a way to work mm -hmm. on. Yeah. yeah. It was also kind of the first time we got together after, during the pandemic where we are like tasked to be close, skin to skin with each other. and. There's a lot of joy in that, but it's also like this grief of like, we haven't had this in a while, right? So. At the time we had to make a choice. Right. Mm -hmm. Do we want to yeah. absorb but, that risk? Right. But we're so comfortable in, in our group that we just jump in and I guess it's shown on camera. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'll, I'll just add that um, I was really struck by a lot of the conversations we had before we headed out mm -hmm. into the field. And so they're all professional dancers, but they have additional jobs that also are about the body and they are about being in close proximity physically with people. So 24 seven, that was, is their lives. And I just remember a lot of uh, hearing them talk about it's, constantly having to gauge in the moment, what kind of risk am I going to take? How big of a risk am I willing to take? And what are the possible repercussions of that? Am I gonna end up getting really, really sick just because I wanna go to a concert? Um, what if I do work with this client with my mask off? What might happen to me or to that client? So I think it was, it, seeped in and out in, in multiple ways. Well, our performers have shared some stories with you to help you understand their process. And what we're gonna do is ask the audience to share some of your stories. And, I'm, I'm, and uh, as we hear these stories, the dancers will do movement and, and interpret them for us. 
Um, so <laughs> Didn't, didn't we discuss this? <laughs> I did, I did, okay. with them. So I'm, I'm wondering when, if anyone's willing to talk about when they first started realizing this is kind of serious stuff here, you know? That, that the, the pandemic wasn't just a, a, a little blip anymore, but something that was becoming much more impactful and much more invasive on their lives. Okay, I'm so not comfortable doing this, but you guys have offered yourselves up. Thank you. I think the visceral quality of your work was so intense, and so I feel free to share that I felt initially disbelief and shock. I thought, seriously, this would be over in two weeks, and we would move on, and it wasn't. So I think we all had moments where we went to really dark places where we thought we wouldn't be able to emerge out of those dark places. And in addition to our dealing with our own emotions, I felt that we were dealing constantly with the emotions of other people. And oftentimes they were angry emotions and dividing. I think that's where I had the hardest time. How did that impact you, if you're willing to talk about it? Well, personally, I stayed in bed for one whole week at one point, unable to really cope or deal with anything, which is odd for somebody who's typically happy. So it forced me to deal with a darker side of my own self and the darker side of other people, I think. So I had to crawl out of that space. And I'm like, So what helped you crawl out of that space? I think my own emotional fortitude at the end of the day. And now that you've, that you've kind of, I don't know, made peace with, with where we're at or adjusted, um, well, like Sarah said, I'm looking for connectivity now and healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what would it look like? What would that look like for you? What? Um, I take a lot of joy in seeing people happy and out again. And I take a lot of joy in going to activities that we didn't have before. Sarah said concerts and on Bainbridge Island, even this weekend, the Moonlight Market. And First Friday, small things. Wow, great. And one more question, if, if you don't mind. What do you think is going to be the new normal? Like, how has the world changed, or has it? Are we gonna go back? It changed. I think once something cracks you open, in the way that we've been cracked open, you can't help but change. And I hope that we're more compassionate going forward for ourselves and others. Is there anything else you want to add? No. I want to thank you for your generosity with the story. Thank you. Do we have other folks who can talk or would like to talk a little bit about their experiences during this time? Maybe some of the changes that, that you've had to, that were difficult to adopt to? Or, what are some of the things that you've discovered during this time? So I think it's interesting that you, Sarah, chose to photograph people in nature um, because the two things that I think kind of saved me through the height of the pandemic were nature. You know, we went into this in March, it was spring, the outside world was waking up, and so even though I was alone, when I was outside, I didn't feel alone because I had all of nature to 
commune with uh, for a long time. And then by the time we on Bainbridge Island were heading into fall and when you know, we, we um, hunkered down for the winter here, um, the other thing that I think was a big saving grace was we had sort of developed pods by that period of time. So you had this sort of feeling among a, a often small group of people who you trusted took things as seriously, risk as seriously as I did, so that we could interact and um, not have so much of that sense of isolation. How were these pods, your interactions with your friends and, and, and uh, pod mates, how were they different from pre-COVID times? Uh, well, what was interesting for me is that I had lived in my neighborhood for about two and a half years at the start of the pandemic, but I didn't really know my neighbors. My neighbors are now among my closest friends on Bainbridge. Um, you know, so we've continued to develop our relationship and support each other in ways that go well beyond what brought us together during the pandemic. And do you, do you have some feel or some idea of what made it really possible for that level of intimacy that, that wasn't there before? A lot of it was, was trust. You know, just um, we got more insight into each other's lives in a way that made us feel safe. You know, how people were managing, were they masking? Did they get their vaccines when vaccines came out? Um, and you know, just finding that common commonality um, so that we could trust each other. Can, can you say a little bit more about that feeling of safety and trust? Um, not sure what else I would say. <laughs> um, like when did you realize that, wow, I, I really trust these people? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we started off with doing gatherings kind of outside and um, very slowly over time moved to gatherings inside. Um, and you know, a lot of it was through just conversation about how we were spending our time, uh, things our families were going through, whether they were here or elsewhere. Uh, just really a much more just open conversation about things. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. These stories are important, you know? These are the stories that will mark this period in time. And everyone's stories are just full of these opportunities for creation, and each of them tells their own story of suffering as well. Um, I'd like to know if what from folks, well, what, what do you feel is missing most, either in the, in the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic or mid-range when we start to realizing that this is going to be with us for a while, or even now when we're in, I guess, phase three of it? Is there anyone who's willing to talk about that? I think we all used to make decisions of what we were going to do, who we were going to do it with, without much thought. We just automatically went out and made ourselves happy. And the thing that I felt most in this pandemic was a constant checking, a constant doubt. Was I making the right decision by going here? Was I making the right decision being with this person? Was the child that I was taking care of was his mom making the right decision. And it just created this era of this feeling of doubt with 
all of your surroundings. Then as it passed and it continued and we had been safe, I began to feel a sense of unreality. And then all of a sudden, it comes knocking at your door. Your, your sister-in-law gets it. Your brother gets it. Your niece gets it. And your whole world feels like it's beginning to crumble around you. So it was a very difficult time. And even though we're coming out of it now, there's so much insecurity in our safety that was never, ever there before. What are some things that you've, that you've discovered you were taking for granted before? Just the automatic, someone calling saying, let's go grab a beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even now, it's a constant, how many people are gonna be there? How close are we gonna get? Um, going to the um, Battaquake Park, looking at the number of cars that were there for the concert and thinking, I just think I'll keep on driving. It's, it's changed a freedom that we had. Mm -hmm. Well, a hedonistic freedom at that, but it's still changed a freedom that we had to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. And now you, you check everything. You, you still question. Can you imagine forward a little bit to when we do finally have a, have a reliable cure or treatment for this? And what, is, what does life look like then as far as trust and as far as these anxieties that you have right now? I think it's going to take a while. I think until we get through several years of having a, a, an established vaccination routine just like the flu, if you don't get your flu shot, that's your dumb fault. You got it. And if you do, okay, relax. It probably won't be as bad as it was. I, I think we'll begin to relax a little bit more, but I don't think it's, it's I think it's always going to be difficult because that will be hanging over us um, and affecting some, some people more than others. And that's the scary part of it. You, know, you don't know who it's going to affect. Hmm. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And, and I'm, what sort of thoughts did, did her story inspire for you? Oh, thank you. It reminded me of um, my grandparents having lived through the Depression. It affected them for the rest of their lives, and it changed forever. They always did things differently, and I wonder if our generation or those of us who have lived through the pandemic will be forever changed. I don't know if that there's going back to normal. Are there things that you that we hope remain after we go back to quote normal? Well, being a germaphobe, yes. <laughs> I love that everybody's more conscientious about the things that we touch and how we interact, but mm -hmm. I don't want it to be so much so that we don't have um, that we don't interact with each other lovingly, you know, and go out into the world. But again, I, rem I remember my grandparents being forever changed by the depression. They, they never went back to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. are, do you, are you able to identify some ways that you think you, you may have changed? Yes. I went to the Mariners game last night, mm -hmm. and I was not comfortable at all. It was the first time that I was out in a big crowd, and I regretted going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it hurt my heart, kind of. Something I would have normally enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I know that one of the, the hardest parts for me was the first set of holidays that we had. And um, yeah, I come from a really kind of huge family. A uh, typical gathering is about 30, 40 people. Uh, everyone would bring in their own dishes, and you'll know that Auntie Tommy's going to bring the really good peach cobbler. And, 
to avoid, you know, Cousin Jason's food altogether and all that. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, I remember going and having a, a Zoom gathering and um, just being really excited to kind of see everybody and everyone's like holding up their plates to show what they're eating at their place and and um, you know, having that those I mean yes it was over Zoom but I was getting to see my cousins and my aunties and uncles and uh, we were getting to spend some time together and I'm wondering do, do, does anybody else have stories that about these moments of connection that were unexpected for them. I think the whole pandemic was very, um, of course, jarring for a lot of people. For me, I had just moved up to this area, so I was brand new and didn't know anyone. Um, so building a community and then are trying to build a community and the pandemic hitting was really hard and the isolation definitely deterred that forward motion of connection. But it inspired connection with self and enjoying that isolation in the beginning, which was beautiful, uh, more than I thought I would enjoy. Um, and it helped me to focus on the people in like my work circle. Who was I interacting with every day and how could I dive deeper with them? Um, and I think that made these like really strong bonds that might have still happened if the pandemic didn't change the plans, but could it have been as strong as it is now? Who knows? Yeah. One of the things that I kind of noticed about the, the bonds that I've been making with folks during the pandemic, um, it reminds me of when, when I was younger, you know, in my teen years, in my 20s, when, when you would love each other fiercely and fearlessly um, because there wasn't that history of heartbreak or there wasn't that history of, of like, friends doing some not so great things to you. Um, so there was just, I don't know, maybe for me there's, there's been this conscious innocence to how we interact and how we connect with people, um, which, I mean, as someone who, who is really introverted and very shy uh, when I'm not doing this, right? <laughs> um, it, for me, I, I, I always felt very, very guarded. But I find myself a lot less guarded with the folks who I interact with now. Um, just because after, you know, two months in an apartment with my cats, I'm really looking forward to something that says more than yeah. at me. Yeah, it's been the same for me when the pandemic hit. Uh, People were kind of living the way I've been living <laughs> for the last nine years or so. So uh, I was starting to see that people in my, my life that I hadn't been spending much time with needed me because things were changing with people personally during the pandemic uh, with their relationships and <laughs> different things that I hadn't been aware of. So I realized that I had been in hiding or not really giving enough to the people in my community here. So um, I'm comfortable being alone, but most people aren't. I kind of feel like the anomaly when I'm out there. I'm like you, I'm out there. But when I'm not, I like to be back in those woods that you were seeing pictures of. Um, so it, really, I became more social because of the pandemic. Uh, a few people in my pod were reaching out to me, so the introvert it was time to step up and, and <laughs> extend myself and help others along. So uh, I guess that's a good thing. I hear Sarah saying people need people. Everybody says that people need people, therapists, psychologists, <laughs> artists. Um, I'm not so sure if that's true or not, but I... I did see it, this example kind of forced in different ways and uh, 
it's nice to be out among the community again. <laughs> was that surprising for you to discover this about yourself? Well, yeah, I guess. I just been, you know, weeks, days turn into months and years quickly. You don't realize how much you, you do uh, kind of keep to yourself and how little you do know of your friends and what they're going through in their homes and your neighbors. And so the pandemic just revved it all up. And so neighbors, friends, things were happening that I hadn't seen or understood. We just don't know what people are going through. And so now I, you know, I make more of an effort. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest thing that's changed about you since the beginning of the pandemic? Probably not enough <laughs> that should change, but um, that I am getting out more and, you know, just if I can just master my neighborhood down there at Pleasant Beach, I feel like if I could just that little microcosm, soak everything up and get out there and support the musicians and local artists and things that go on. We're lucky to live here. I mean, really, especially through COVID, like you said, we could go for walks in woods and be down at a beach and see mountains. And, you know, I mean, we were fortunate to be here. And if we could take advantage of it during COVID and keep that going, keep the appreciation of it all going beyond, then that'd be good for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you for all the stories, folks. I mean, these are incredible points, incredible like opportunities for connection with all of us, you know? I mean, I think we can truly say that, that every one of us can feel a little more connected with the folks in this room and with the dancers on stage. And, and I want to thank you all yeah, thank for you. your performances, and for your movements and... Um, at this point, we do have some time for time for Q and A for anybody who is up here. Um, so we welcome your questions. Yes. Were you at Bloedel filming? No, but that's my next stop. <laughs> because I think I saw on the Bloedel website something about dancing in nature. Yes. 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 That was not me. Okay, and it wasn't <laughs> and it wasn't your cast. No. 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 Okay. No. I just wondered. Love that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Were you on the island? Yes. Um, I I live here, and they all live in Seattle. Um, so they they would come out for our field practices, and um, I had predetermined certain locations, um, but beyond that, not much else. And we went to public parks. We visit a neighbor's property. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this, is, this is for the dancers. Um, I, I, you answered my first question, which was, do you give any verbal clues to each other? And obviously, you do, don't seem to give any verbal clues. <laughs> but do you give any kind of clues to each other as to what you may be thinking to move the other dancer the way you want the other dancer to go? Or do you, is it a, a response totally among all three of you, a total response to the other three? Is there anyone that takes a lead, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, and it's just magic. <laughs> it's magic. This is, this is the magic. And, and before Sarah mentioned that we've worked together, so it, part of, part of the, the existing trust is that we have worked a lot together, but I mean, it did feel, you know, kind of wild to be on stage right now because we have we haven't yeah. moved together and improvised together in, in like a minute. But like that language is still there, and it's sort of like think of it as like kind of like skin listening, and you could you could see like things happening. It's like oh, like right now we're all like picking up on this energetic thing that's sort of happening, but no, there's no leader, definitely not. Do actors do they do acting? there's a story that informs the movement. As you're moving, there, there might be a sense that you're moving towards, but they won't know what mine is, I won't know what theirs is, we may have conflicting stories. That was actually something that struck me listening to the lecture, that you can draw a story out of those still images, and some of those I'm thinking, oh, I don't remember <laughs> my 
survival in this, but there was a story that I'm following or someone's following. And it's, a, it's kind of a learned language, but rule number one of that language is to not create or push. Sure. So there might be a response to cues, but if I have an idea of, I wanna make Henry go here, <laughs> I'm just gonna send him off balance from wherever his story is. So there, there's a lot of nuance. Yeah. I feel like it's just a practice of listening. Like listening to your stories, also listening to each other's bodies and movement and I, energies mostly. Because sometimes I'm like, I just want to be separated. Sometimes I want to be in the mix of it. And yeah, there's no leader, but everybody's also a leader in a way. <laughs> we lead our own stories, but we help each other create moments. Oh. Oh, I have a question about, um, so Sarah's work here is f photography, which is still image, and then you guys are working in this temporal way with each other in this space that's not a stage, it's like this sort of infinite possibilities. And so it's like this conversation happening between something that's temporal and infinite and something that is still and is in this rectangle. But then when you are working together and you're going around to these different spaces, do, does Sarah show you some of the photos or like how it's being framed or at any point when you're moving together, are you thinking, does it ever enter in your mind anything about the still image or the rectangle? Or, it, or has it like, did it never, and then soon after, like working a few times, and it was like it started to be some part of it? I like this question. It's really interesting. Yeah. I have my own but I like to answer this. Oh, oh. I think at the beginning, C would show us a few images, but I, in, a, in a sense, I'd rather not see them at the moment because it informs too much of what we're doing, and I want to be in the moment of creating and feeling rather than seeing the end results. Like, um, even today, there's some, <laughs> there's some captures that was like, whoa, what is that? That's beautiful, but I wasn't aware of it. I wasn't, like, it's like whatever I feel at the moment was, was clearly shown on camera, but I wasn't creating. I was trying to rec I wasn't trying to force it to happen. It just like it's it's there and it's it's kind of that beautiful moment. So sometimes I just ask her not to show me anything until mm -hmm. later. <laughs> later, later, later. <laughs> it's hard not to you know scroll and say, look at that's so awesome. Look at how that turned out. And they're like, no. <laughs> that's that's my point of view, but I don't. I mean, other people would probably would like to see more. Opposite because every once in a while saying like oh here's this one or here's how these are shaping up gives me some sense of the eye that Sarah has um, in a little bit of a way that allows you to lean into this realm where we're exploring this idea of proximity and intimacy but as far as instructions the limits were pretty much like here's the, the general frame and yet, much of it is out of the frame, which lends itself to the final image, or the, we're going to use this rock. <laughs> and see what you can do on this rock. But there's no staging, really. And I think some of your question also had to do with like the framing of this space as well. Um, and I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no point in this project where we've been in this like sterile space um, <laughs> on this like, like small floor. And yeah, also, no, and also, yeah, the, I knew exactly what I was doing. Um, yeah. And I was like, do I, I let them know? Yeah, yeah. There's the thing. part of the performance. Um, uh, there's, uh, it, I mean, the, the, the pace of what we were doing here is different from how we're working in front of the camera, um, where everything is like quite slow, which is also like, not normal for us right. as performers. Um, well, because also have a lot of different elements to deal with. Absolutely, Rocks. absolutely. There's, there's way, way more, way more, to, way more things to play right. with, and um, like off. textures. So, right. yeah. yeah, which informs a lot in the in what we like, you know, what we do in the field too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like texture, lighting, like feeling, smell sometimes. Yeah. Whatever. That's a good point. <laughs> that smells, yeah, smells yeah, and textures. Yeah, the sun and on your face right. and the wind in your hair. There's, there's something that lends itself to the, yeah. the moment of it. Totally. The coolness of the rocks and all the different crevices and all that stuff. Well, and something that I keep like kind of coming back to is uh, like also the temptation when we're, we're when we're moving in in a space like this for like people who haven't probably haven't engaged with us as performers is to uh, like uh, to want to move from a shape based place um, versus a sensation based place. Mm -hmm. And when we're being photographed and things are happening like a slow scale and we're really investigating skin and closeness, we can move from a sensation based place. And so. I think you probably saw like a like a middle a middle ground here. Um, <laughs> Maybe in the beginning, yeah. Trying to like yeah. navigate. What is this? Yeah. Oh. I have a question for the dancers. Whenever you're interpreting, I loved how you put that you listened to each other. Um, through touch, when you're listening and interpreting another story from someone else. Were you listening more toward the tonality or what each word meant? Do you interpret the word or, or kind of the energy of, of the room? I was just interested. Good question. Yeah. For me, it shifted a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I would gather general meaning, but there's, there's a lot to intake right. in terms of mapping the space and kind each of other too much, taking a story. <laughs> um, but there's always, words have a lot of meaning and power and there are words that stand out where it's like you could take the middle parts of stories out and isolate them down to a couple descriptive words and still have a lot of the meaning involved. And so sometimes it like it snaps me back into reality when I hear one of those words and my first instinct is to go to that shape. Like, yeah. <laughs> this word relates to like a, a, a feeling or emotion and it'll pull me there and then I'll go back and of something yeah for me I just let like um, it's keep morphing as, as Sarah used the term because sometimes I'm in the middle of exploring this like a part of the story that somebody told me listen happened to listen on and kind of encapsulating in my movement but then you know another person then the stories kind of move on to the next person <laughs> next idea and I'm like okay I'm just capturing that kind of moment and then morphing into the next thing. And also like listening to each other, it's like, are we in that particular moment in mm -hmm. a sense at a moment mm -hmm. or no? Or do we feel like, okay, I think that that narrative is done, we're moving on <laughs> to the next thing, which is like we discover together again, right? I feel like that's the processes today. I think we have time for one more. I have a couple of questions. Have you ever been injured? Doing oh, this. Like ever? Ever? <laughs> no, ever been injured doing your your uh, improv dancing? Not as part of this. No. Definitely as the Maybe some splinters <laughs> at once in a while. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and um, I'm interested in your training. Uh, and do you do anything? Uh, what uh, what other uh, dance forms do you do, or is it just improv? High focus on movement art. Yeah. Wait. That's, that's right. Movement artists. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I just like that. I, yeah, I, I mean, we've all we've all been in improvisational performances. Right. We've all been in more like kind Structure. of con concert dance. Um, I you know we all have old traditional old old, old traditional technical backgrounds. Yeah. Um, and then we also all work in other media and have you know, Maya's a chiropractor and I'm a massage therapist and there's like a lot of different different ways that we do the things. <laughs> Thanks. Ken, um, we did have one more question over here. I wanted to give Harini an opportunity to ask it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the talk and the wonderful live interpretation. Um, so my question is for Sarah. Um, I was curious how your background as a dancer influenced your engagement with the performers. Did it help hinder, get in the way? Um, yeah. It greatly helped. 
Um, and it was the reason for um, having a background in dance is the reason that I photograph the way that I do. Um, and I always am wanting to get closer and closer, specifically for this project. Um, there is a bodily intelligence that once you spend years and years cultivating, does stay in there. Um, at least that's my experience with it. Um, and while I might not be virtuosic anymore, if I ever was, I still have um, a bodily awareness to sense with them. And it was, you know, the way they've talked about improvising tonight. That's in there for me too. And it is um, the, I think there's an ability to um, kind of ride on their energy and I can sense ways that their weight, their, their weight is going to shift. I can sense when gestures are coming. I can see peaks and ebbs and flows, and we just kind of get into this. <laughs> this. <laughs> um, and we and trust that we're never. Yeah. Right. You let them you the camera because right. you're doing this to right. dance with us. I don't have to think about right. where you are. Yeah, exactly. So, and so I'm, I'm very aware that I also have this extra object that's between me and them, and having to make room, literally, for that um, is an important piece of it. But, um, you know, one of the things I love about um, this project and getting to photograph them um, is it really affords us a different perspective of um, this kind of work. Because when we're in a theater and we're in a formal setting, you all are sitting in a single chair and you have a single view and you're having, therefore, a single experience. But what I try to do, um, sort of capitalize on my dance background, is to get into the nooks and crannies and find these perspectives that you're never going to get. Um, and that's my joy of photographing <laughs> moving bodies. You know, and as they were up here today, I was like, oh my god, where's my camera? I, I, thinking about I know, I was, I was like, like it was very, a hard time. I'm, I'm having a very hard time. Yeah, because it's I'm just I'm seeing um, I'm seeing the forms and the shapes um, you know for what they are, but also I know them so well as individuals. Um, so it's important for me to capture their personalities as well. Um, but yeah, so that's for me the difference between Watching performance and photographing performance as documenting it, right? That's one type of photograph you're going to see, but it's a, it's a very different um, in, yeah. <laughs> your exhibition opening? Um, December 1st. Wow. Uh, December 1st to the 30th. Um, it is at the Collective Visions Gallery in Bremerton in their underground gallery. And um, yes, we would love to have you to have you there. So thank you again for coming. Thank you very much.